so good. Uh, that is from the great theologian uh, Louis C.K. By the way, if you're on Pandora and Comedy Station and you hear Louis C.K., please fast forward to the next one. The opinions of Louis C.K. do not necessarily represent those of Canyon Springs Church. <laughs> But it's true, right? I mean, when was the last time you talked to somebody about flying and they were amazed that they could go cross country in five hours? I mean, that trip used to take six months, you know, by mule and you'd be a completely different group of people because some of you would die on the way and we can fly cross country and yet we're complaining, oh man, you know, the, the movie on my flight wasn't very good. Really? Wow, crazy, huh? I, I do understand it, though. I, I have I just flew, flew recently to Chicago, and the person that I was sitting next to, I was in the middle seat, and the person I was sitting next to, and I'm not making this up, was 375 pounds, because he told me. He was proud. <laughs> I'm 375 pounds. I have not sat that close to a person I wasn't dating ever. <laughs> And it was five hours. Wow. I felt intimately invo in, in, involved in his life afterwards. <laughs> it's, a cra it's crazy. It's just the, I think it's the land that we live in where all of these amazing things are happening and we just t totally take them for granted. And flying is just one thing that we complain about. Let me give you another, and I promise you we complain more about this than any, and it, it's incredible what it can do. Okay, look at your phone right now. I mean, just think of what this can do, all right? First off, you can make phone calls, okay, kids? Do, do you realize that? It can actually make phone calls? <laughs> uh, you could check email, you can check text. It includes every phone number you've ever had. If you're lazy, you can talk into it, and it will write it all out for you. And sometimes it gets it right, right? <laughs> Who uses talk to text? Who uses talk to text? Who makes fun of people that use talk to text, okay? Every kid in the room makes fun of me. My children make fun of me. Dad, you sound like a robot, you know, when you talk. And why do you say period at the end? You're st <laughs> stupid. They're right. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous what this can do, right? Um, you can, this right here can hold every song you've ever purchased. And if you want, you can say into it, Siri, play my Sharona, and it will do it. <laughs> and if you want to just have a radio station where all you listen to is big hair bands from the 80s or 90s grunge or everything done by Justin Bieber, you can set up that on this device. If you get lost, it's a GPS, and it can help you find your way. Do you know that this is also a computer? And that the computer in this device right here is bigger than the computers on the first spaceships that we sent to the moon. More computing ability here. I made a list. I couldn't think of everything, but maybe you could add something. You could use it to calculate equations, check sound levels, check the weather, keep track of how many steps you've taken, read the latest news, check in on what the Padre score is. By the way, they're losing. <laughs> I'm just guessing, I don't know, I'm just thinking. <laughs> you could check your Facebook status, it can wake you up in the morning, no more alarm clocks, it can pay your bills, and find out really important information like who played Gibby on iCarly. You need to know that information. Will somebody look that up for me? Somebody look that up for me, I need to know right now. Somebody, anybody willing to look that up for me? What's that? He's a Biola kid, all right, you don't even need to look it up. What's his name? He forgot, okay. <laughs> Noah Monk, okay, thank you. Do you know that in 2007, June 28th, we, this, this didn't even exist, and you need to carry around a giant phone book and a map and an alarm clock and GP, all of those things. You, this didn't even exist before 2007, and yet I promise you, these are the kinds of things that you say to your phone no, I didn't want to FaceTime Jenny. I just wanted to call Jenny. You're so stupid. <laughs> no, no, I didn't want to pay my bill. I just want to look for the weather. You always click on the wrong thing. What, 20%? I just charged you. What's wrong with you? It's us, right? This amazing device that we have that 
We, we'd be lost without. When it came out, we were so excited. And now we're just irritated by it. Because we live in a world where everything is amazing. And technology is ridiculous. But nobody's really all that happy about it. Let me give you just a couple observations. You tell me if this is true. I believe that over the course of your lifetime, in fact, over the course of the next 10 years, there will be an invention that comes out that none of us even know about today that will radically change the way society is done. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with this? That shortly thereafter, we will find a way to be irritated with that technology that we didn't even know existed now. Let me give you a third. Maybe, I don't know if you agree with this, maybe this just sounds like old man Jack, okay? But you will probably also be amazed that this new technology that comes out that's so amazing, that changes your life, that you kind of get over pretty quickly, also will tend to pull people away in relationship. Because that's typically what our technology does, doesn't it? You know? All kinds of things that I didn't even know about that big party that you guys all planned you to invite me to. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to have something greater than a joy that is dependent on technology? Because technology is clearly letting us down. We have everything. We have better cars and better dishwashers and we have better you know, devices than ever, but we also have more depression and more you know, antidepressants and dealing with difficult things. Wouldn't you like to have a happiness that is based on something bigger than our technology? Where in difficult situations you could still find joy. In rough times you could, you, you were that person where you could see the good in it. You could find something good about that situation. Wouldn't you like to be that person? Over the next month we're going to look at this world where everything is amazing and nobody's happy and we'll see if we can find a different kind of joy. To do that, we're going to look into the book of Philippians. It's four little chapters that talks about how you and I can have this joy that transcends the world around us. So here's how we're going to start. Why don't you bow your heads? And I'm going to give you just 30 seconds. I don't know, maybe there are a bunch of church people. Maybe there are people that aren't church people. You're not really even, you don't even know what to do during prayer. Um, you're, maybe you're looking at your phone right now. Um, but pray this. Just say, God, would you speak to me? Maybe, maybe as I'm talking, you're thinking, you know what? I would like that. I'm not really a church person, but I would like that kind of joy. God, would you give me the kind of joy that goes beyond my circumstances? Just take about 30 seconds and pray right now. Lord God, I pray that you would be in this room. A lot of people, different places, different places in life, young, old. But I'm guessing that there is some difficulty here, that there is some distraction, that there are people who are having rough, going through rough times. And I pray, God, that you would speak to us in a way that only you can. We're inviting your spirit into this room to speak to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, uh, for the opportunity to be here. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your Bible and open it to, up to Philippians chapter 1, right? If you don't have a Bible, we have some in the back, or you, can, you know what? There's Bible apps on your phone. You can do that too. That way it looks like you're paying attention, but you're reading your email. So if you looked at Philippians 1, let me give you some of the background on this book. It's written by a guy named Paul. Paul is, uh, began his life as somebody who really hated the church. He hated Jesus, didn't want anything to do with it. In fact, when we first meet him, he's hunting Christians. He's hunting them down to throw them in jail because he wants nothing to do with Christianity. He's this Jewish Pharisee, and Christianity goes against everything he thought, so he's hunting them down. Well, one day he's going down this road. He's on this road to Damascus, and this, he sees this big, bright light, and Jesus is speaking to him and saying, Paul, what's up? Why are you chasing me? Why are you pursuing my people? Why are you persecuting me? 
What's your problem? And in that moment, Paul encounters Jesus. He becomes completely blind. They lead him into the city. Uh, this man named Ananias comes, but sent by God, and prays over him. He gets his sight. But not only does he get his sight, he sees life differently. He realizes that this Jesus is transformational and can change his life. From that moment, he goes around the world to tell people this story of what happened to him and what, ha what Jesus can do in your life. He hooks up with this guy named Barnabas and they go all over the place. And it's, there are some great, amazing moments, but there are some tough moments. He's shipwrecked, he's beaten several times, he's stoned, and not like in the way you're thinking, but <laughs> lots of stuff happened to him and he ends up in jail, chained to a prison guard. And that's when he starts writing this book, Philippians. This book has a single theme, and that theme is joy. Now, if you got your Bible, look at uh, first verse 1, Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, says this. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all God's holy people in Christ at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he's with his buddy Timothy. Timothy's uh, uh, Paul is at this point under house arrest. So he's chained to a prison guard, but his buddy Timothy is there. And he knew all these people at Philippi. He had wandered around and he had talked to them. These are a lot of his friends that he's speaking to. And this is the general theme of this letter that he writes. We find it in Philippians 4.4, 4, and he says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say, rejoice. Now, is there anything strange about that line to you? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Anything strange about it? He's writing from prison. He's writing because, and he's chained to somebody else. I, if I'm writing from prison, it sounds like this. Oh my gosh, this place is terrible. I don't like the people. The food's awful and I can never get remote and they're only watching Storage Wars. Come on. What the heck? That's, the, that's what it sounds like coming out of me. And coming out of Paul, it sounds like, yay! Rejoice. It's all good. Everything's great. I'd like that kind of joy in my life. I'd like to be able to feel that kind of peace in any circumstance. Anybody with me on that? We, as we look at this first chapter, Paul dispel some rumors that we think that we need to be happy in our lives. And there's three of them, and I want to give you three of them. Uh, and the first one is this, and that's this, I can't be happy unless I've got it all together. Unless I've figured it out, how I can have it all together, that's when I'm really going to be happy. You know, I want my life to be together, I want my, the pieces to fit, I want my clothes to be in style, I want to be, make sure I've got the right makeup on, I want to make sure I have really, really cool, cool shoes, um, mentally I want to be in a good place, uh, I want to be rested, I want to be healthy, I want to be strong, I want to be in shape. Once all those things are together, then I'm going to be in a really good place and I'm going to feel really good about myself. Now, I don't think anybody actually says those words. You know, I need everything to be good for me to be happy. We just live that way, right? Because the minute you're going through life and something bad happens and, and somebody says something stupid about you or, or you, you know, say something about a friend, you feel bad that you said that or Something goes wrong at, at, at your house, and all of a sudden, your joy starts to leak, right? And all you can think about is that one little situation. And you might not ever say, I need everything to be working out to be happy, but that's how we live. Paul lived a different way. Uh, look with me at verse 3. He's talking to his friends. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for you. I always pray with joy. Of course you do. You're in jail. Naturally. Duh. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now look at verse 6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You know what he's saying in this, this line right here? You are not complete. You're not all together. You got a lot of stuff to work on. You got a lot of stuff to figure out relationally, 
you are not all together. Mentally, you don't have it all figured out. Emotionally, there are times when you're up and down and you turn over. You are not complete. And I think we all pretty much get this. We just don't like to admit it. You know, you, you don't ever want anybody to come up to you and give you this compliment. Man, Jack, you've really grown. I know that's a com I hate that compliment. Because it sounds like, you know, you used to be a real jerk, but now you're better. <laughs> but it's true. We all have grown. We all need to continue to grow. And let me give you the second part of the story. It says, not only are you not complete, but God is going to work to complete you. But he who began a good work in you, he's going to be faithful to figure it out and help you figure out your relationships and help you figure out how to treat people and help you figure out how to talk to people and help you to figure out how to mature and be a better person. You know what this does for me? When I realize that I do not have to be complete, it puts me at ease. And you know what I found out too? Maybe some of you found this out. People like me better when I'm real. People like me better. People accept me better when I'm authentic and I, and I tell the dumb things that happen in my life and I admit that I, don't, I just don't have it all together. And I, and I need to work on stuff. Um, you know, I want to say this too. We have junior high and high school kids in here today. We have younger kids because it's Mother's Day. I want, just want you to figure this out. And you, you hope that you're going to be complete. And if you can't be complete, and if you can't be all together, you're going to at least pretend to be all together. And you're going to take pictures on your Instagram, and pictures on your Facebook, and post them of when you are at your best so that people will like you. And I'm here to tell you that more people will like you if you're honest and real. And you know what they'll say to you when you're honest and real with them? And say, this is what I'm struggling. You know what most people will say? Me too. Me too. I get it. Uh, years ago, Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife. What, what a life that must have been, right? She's driving down the road, and there's road construction. How many people love road construction? <laughs> oh, it's the worst. I, me and my daughter, Sterling, we, were just, we were, went to Disneyland, and we got done at 11. And w I would never stay to Disneyland until 11, because i got to drive home. But we, I'm thinking to myself, well, at least... There will be no traffic and I will cruise home. Guess what? Anybody guess? Road construction, an hour and a half longer than it usually takes to get home. And part of it, because I tried to get you know, a back road and that didn't work. <laughs> ah. Well, Ruth Graham is more spiritual than I. I know that's a big surprise to you. She had a different attitude through this, and she's driving through this road construction, and finally, one road becomes two, and the construction is over. And at the end of the construction, she reads this sign. End of construction, thank you for your patience. And as she sees that, she thinks to herself, that is what I want on my gravestone. And so here it is. Ruth Belgram. June 10th, 1920 to June 14th, 2007. End of construction. Thank you for your patience. That is when the construction stops. That's when you stop growing. That's when you stop maturing. That's when you stop needing to be better. When it's over. You know, we think to ourselves, man, if I, if I only had it all together, I'll be happy. Well, I'm telling you something. That's never happening. It's just a rumor. Let me give you a second rumor. I can't be happy unless my circumstances are right. You know, if we, first off, I've got to have my, all my things together, my, personally, but all the circumstances around me need to be good, too. My house needs to be in order. I need to be in a good place financially. Uh, I, I need, my relationships need to be working. I need to have a good job. Uh, I need to be a part of the popular crowd. I need to have, make sure I have lots of friends around here. I need to make sure that my kids are treating me with respect and that my parents aren't bugging me. I, I, I need to be dating somebody. Uh, I need my marriage to be good. Now, now those are not the same person, by the way. Because <laughs> if you're dating somebody, your marriage is not going to be good. I'm just telling you that. 
you know, we have the same problem that we have with circumstances that we own our own personal stuff, right? And that it, you just can't get it all to the place where it all figure, works out, right? You just can't do it. Because just about the time everything is great, then your kid gets sick. Just about the time everything's great, then you get this big major bill. And just about the time you get, you know, toothache. And just about the time everything's working out, your car breaks down. Somebody says something dumb to you. All of a sudden, boom, you're in that same spot. Once again, circumstances. It just doesn't work like that. Paul has a different idea. Look at verse 12. It says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, and he's talking about being in jail, what's happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Now, as you read that, what attitude does he have? I don't understand it, but it's good. He has this great attitude. Where is this coming from? There is not enough circumstantial evidence for Paul to be happy. His circumstances are terrible. I mean, the food's bad, and I'm chained to this guy. And I, How is he happy? Listen, I'm going to tell you, there will never be enough circumstantial evidence for you to be a happy person. It just doesn't work like that. Especially if you're a mom, right? Moms, somebody, somebody uh, wrote this. Tell me if you agree with this. Found this this last week. Here are some things that uh, are common among mothers. If you're a mom, you're willing to kiss your child's boo-boo regardless of what body part it happens to be on. Think about that. No, maybe don't. <laughs> you have time to shave only one leg at a time. You hide in the bathroom to be alone. Okay, honestly, who has done that? <laughs> Your kid throws up and you catch it. <laughs> it's just reflex, right? You get up at 5 a.m. and you have no time to eat, sleep, drink, or go to the bathroom, and yet you still manage to gain 10 pounds. Being a mom, look, the circumstances never line up. The car breaks down, the, the, your kid hates you, you know, your, 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 your husband has a tough time. That's just life. We've got to figure out some way to have a, a joy that goes beyond our circumstances. Now, let me, let me help you understand something. I want to talk about the first point and the second point and how they work together. The first point was, do anybody remember? It was like five minutes ago. The first point was that we don't have it all together, right? We're always growing, we're always working. Well, what's the best way to get somebody to grow and mature? It's difficult times. It's when your circumstances go bad and when they go south. And if you talk to anybody who's lived their life, they will tell you that they didn't grow when they won that lottery or they didn't grow when their house went up in value. What caused them to grow was when their kid went through a bad time, when they walked through a depressing time, and when they lost a job, when they're financially out of it. That's what they'll tell you. Everyone. The circumstances grow us inside. That's how they work together. I want you to know, if, if I were you, I would underline these lines. Paul's writing says, because of my chains, because of my chains, these people are hearing about it. Because of my chains, everybody around me is hearing the gospel. Because of my chains. I gotta tell you, most of the good and the usability that each of you has is because of your chains. Now you all know my background. I grew up, dad was an alcoholic and drank a lot. My parents fought and uh, my dad wasn't a happy TV drunk. He was a violent drunk and would swear. And uh, I remember walking down the hallway when I was 12 years old, and my dad was so drunk, he right, walked right past me and didn't even recognize me, didn't even acknowledge me. Uh, one time I'm at home, and I got woken up to a gunshot because my dad was attempting or pretending like he was going to commit suicide. I think it was just to get back at my mom. This is my life. Let me tell you something. I do not have the job I have today in spite of those circumstances. I do what I do today because of them. It is because of my chains. And that will be you too. 
And I want to talk to some of the younger people in the room because I want you to understand this. You're going through a hard time, and everybody does. It's just life. It's just part of it. And I wish I could take that away and that everything would go well for you. But here's the reality. When you lean on Jesus, you go through the hard time, and it's difficult, and you fight through it, and you work through it. Then the day will come when you're on the other side of it. And you know what God will do with you then? He will use you to make a difference in the life of somebody else. And you will sit across from somebody and you'll be able to say, yeah, I went there too. This is how I got through it. And the joy that will come up in your soul when you find your purpose like that will be amazing. Let me tell you something. To be happy, you don't have to have everything together. You don't have all your circumstances together. Let me give you one last rumor. We, we feel like I can't be happy uh, unless I'm out of danger, unless I'm, everything is safe around me. I can't be happy unless everything is safe. Look with me at verse 18. Paul says this, I will continue to rejoice, of course, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body. There's an important line. Whether by life or by death. And then he says maybe his most famous line ever. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For I, if I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in my body. And he's battling back and forth. Should I stay here? So if I stay here, I can help out all these people. But if I die, then I get to be with Jesus and my body's going to be all better, right? The construction will be over. What do I do? Now, why is he thinking about these things? Is he just a philosopher? And that's why he's thinking, oh, maybe I should do this, maybe I should No, that's not why he's thinking about it. He is thinking about life and death because every day he wakes up wondering if today is the day they will kill me. Now, I don't know if you know anything about the way the Romans treated their prisoners, but, but let me help you understand. And one of the things that Romans would do to their prisoners is that they would beat them. And they would beat them 40 lashes minus one. Have you heard that? Have you heard that? And what it is is they have this whip, and it's got all these strands, and they take it across your back, and they pull it down, and these pieces of metal and bone, and, and they do that 39 times, and they don't do it 40 because they think 40 will lead to death. So they only do it 39. Have you ever heard the phrase, beaten within an inch of your life? It's 2,000 years old, and this is where it came from. By the way, that happened to Paul five times. This is another rumor. I'm sure Paul heard about this. Uh, Mark, who wrote the book of Mark, you know, Gospel of Mark? You guys heard of that? Pretty, you know, pretty good book. Um, they got tired of Mark. The Romans got tired of Mark. And so they tied him to a chariot and they drove the chariot for two consecutive days. First, they drove it to kill him. Second, they drove it to be an example to the people around. Don't mess with us. There's another I just read about this last week. I never heard of it. But Nero, um, when he didn't like Christians, what he would do is they would kill a wild animal, a big animal like a bear or a deer or whatever, and then they would so. Christians into the flesh and then they would release dogs and that's how these people were killed Paul lived in a place where he never knew if he was going to get another day if this was the day that they're going to get tired of him as if this is the day that they're going to crucify him or kill him or trample him or whatever and he says this for me to live it's good to die is good You know, we live in a kind of a scary world, don't we? We do. Uh, and some of these things are very real. You know, terrorism's real, and, and people breaking into your house is real, and we you know, hear all kinds of horrible stories, and thank you, news, for showing us every terrible thing that happens in our world. Thank you so much. And maybe this is the greatest news of all. If you're in a relationship with Jesus, to die is gain. And 
God will restore your body. And all those issues that you deal with, God will put you right. You don't need to be in a place where you don't fear to feel joy because you can feel joy knowing that God has got you. Now, I realize to this point this message has been very up here, you know, a lot of mental, a lot. I want to get real practical for a second. Um, over this next month, we're going to talk more about how we can find this kind of joy. But today, right now, I want to get practical. And the first thing I want to challenge you to do, and these are actually written, I believe, on your outline, is maybe take this challenge. Do a technology fast this week and find out just how dependent you are just how dependent you are on your cell phone and just how dependent you are on watching TV for joy, just how dependent you are on Instagram, just how dependent you are on Facebook to stay connected. Find out how much you lean on those things for joy. Okay? Secondly, be on the lookout for something to be joyful about today because we, we really have to switch the way we think because the way most of us think is if everything's good, then I'm going to be happy. Well, we know that can't happen. So instead, here's what I want you to do. In the midst of your difficult, find something good. In the midst of your hard, and maybe it's a conversation that you have with a friend, or maybe it's a time that you have with God, or maybe there's a moment of laughter. Just live in that. Sit in that. Let that happen to you. Be the person that finds something good in your situation rather than the person that needs everything good to be happy. Lastly, maybe do this. Maybe write the end of your story. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what horrible thing is happening to you in your life right now. But I do know this, that if you hang in there, you ask God into it, at the end of the day, God will bring good out of it. And you will be used to make a difference in the life of somebody else. So maybe just take the time and say, okay, God, I'm going to hang in there. And this is what you've told me you're going to do. And write the end of that. We're going to take the next month. This is a hard subject. You certainly can't learn it in one day. We're going to take a month to find out how you and I can find this kind of joy in whatever we're going through. Let me take a moment. I'm going to pray for you. Maybe I'll just say this. You know where all this begins, right? You've got to have this relationship with this, with this Jesus. When you have this relationship with Jesus, he comes into your life, he, um, he forgives all the mistakes that you've made, he brings his spirit in to give you strength to be able to find joy in circumstances. I mean, really, you're not going to have joy in tough circumstances without some extra help. And Jesus promises he'll give that. And if you want to have this kind of relationship with Jesus, it begins very simply. It's a hard life to live, it, uh, honestly. But it begins simply. You just pray this. Say, dear God, come into my life. God, I give my life to you today. Instead of me running my life, I'm going to have you run my life. Teach me what that means, but I'm giving you my life today. If you prayed that, that begins a brand new life. We'd love to know about it. Go to our information table. We'll get you some information. I'll fill out your card. We, you, you can contact me at jackatcanyonsprings.org, but we'd love to know about it. That's where it begins. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would bring joy to the people here, that we would learn to lean on you, and that whatever situation they are walking through, God, that you would bring joy despite their circumstances. In your name we pray. Amen.